Hello fellow members of the Midnight Society, welcome back to another episode review from the show Are You Afraid of the Dark? Last time we covered the tale of Cutter's Treasure, parts 1 and 2, a Gary and Frank story about two brothers who confront a pirate curse that has plagued their family for a century. Tonight's narrative, from Kiki, is about two kids who encounter a supernatural and sinister force at their local library. Submitted for the approval of the Midnight Society, I call this Season 4, Episode 6, The Tale of the Quiet Librarian. We open on what has to be my favorite Frank moment of all time. You know, until Kiki has to go and ruin it. This is real fair. You're only 200 pounds heavier than me. Shh. I'm not hurting him. I know. Kiki tells everyone to listen. Sam asks what they're listening for, and Kiki says, silence. What? How do you hear silence? Isn't silence the lack of sound, and sound is what you hear? Uh, Kiki clarifies that she means total silence, which really clears that up for me. Thank you. Um, anyway, Gary lets his nerd flag fly by saying, It's impossible. Absolute silence doesn't exist. Kiki starts the preamble for her story by asking, what if you could create absolute silence? To which Gary replies, He couldn't. Where there's life, there's sound. Jesus, Gary, that's my whole damn point. I'm trying to set a mood here. Now you interrupt again. I'm gonna cut a bit. What? No, that wasn't me. Tucker told me to say it. Kiki's tale begins at a public library where a group of young kids is on a field trip tour of the facility. The teacher leads them off to the children's library, but one soon-to-be victim, uh, I mean, child, lags behind. He has a bouncy ball that gets away from him going down some stairs. He follows after it, as most first victims do in similar situations. The ball rolls behind a metal shelving unit in front of a door which has a very bright light shining from underneath it. The boy ventures past the shelving to retrieve the ball, and I would like to point out that up to this point, the boy and the ball have been relatively quiet. I mean, the loudest sound the ball makes is... It's no louder than a footstep. And the only reason I bring this up is because future me already told me that I'm gonna be confused about some things at the end of this. Really, future me? You couldn't have told me something useful or given me some winning lotto numbers? <laughs> future me is a schmuck. It's sensitive. Anyway, our ginger victim accidentally pushes his ball under the door before seeing writing on the door that says, Quiet Reading Room. The kid then ponders how that could be taken a number of different ways. I mean, is it a quiet room for reading? Or is it a room specifically for quiet reading? Or is it more of a statement, as in, quiet, this is a reading room? I mean, he, he doesn't actually say any of that, but I mean, you could see him thinking it. The door suddenly opens, resulting in... We cut to a history class where we meet one of our main characters, Lori. The teacher has assigned a partner project, and Lori is being paired with Jace. Jace? I think I know him. Lucky you, not. Hey, there's no need for that. I mean, it's, it's not like we're tight or anything. I mean, he's like my sixth cousin, twice removed, so we're practically strangers. <laughs> anyway, uh, Lori thinks that Jace is kind of cute, but her friend is not a fan, saying... Trust me, if his head got any bigger, they'd put him in a parade. <laughs> Jace discovers that Lori is his partner, and while he thinks that she's okay, his friend says... Her head's got too many points. <laughs> if it were any bigger, they'd put her in a parade. <laughs> These kids gotta come up with some better burns. Substitute chemistry teacher? Come on, Rubio, hit him back. Later, in the hall, Lori hears Jace's friend making fun of her, and... It goes over well. Looks like we're gonna be working together. Wow, I feel so privileged. Back over at the library, two girls are downstairs where our first victim got silenced. The younger girl is reciting her ABCs while the older one is holding an old book. The younger girl wanders off, and then this happens. I would also like to point out that this girl also wasn't being loud. I mean, she literally said one thing, but I mean, she did drop her book right in front of that nearly empty shelving unit in front of the creepy door, which will be the first place the authorities will look for her. So we cut to the police investigation currently in progress. Wait, what? If two children went missing at the local public library within a short span of time, that place would be closed to the public or at the very least, there would be a police presence on hand. How is everyone acting like nothing happened? Wait. Wait, this story doesn't take place in Derry, Maine, does it? Oh, yeah. Lori tasks Jace with getting her some books from downstairs. He doesn't want to go and challenges her to flip for it, telling her to live dangerously. 
He loses the toss and ends up going to get the books anyway. While downstairs, Jace makes sure the coast is clear before revealing a secret. <laughs> oh my god, if those glasses were any bigger, they'd be in a parade. <laughs> Wait, what the f did I just say? After finding the books, the ginger's bouncy ball hits Jace in the leg. While looking around for the owner, Jace gets a jump scare. I hate to keep telling you to remember things that just happened for later, but future me said that I'm going to have a lot of questions. <laughs> Man, I hate that guy. I'm cool, bro. Jace gets Lori the books, but was in such a hurry to get back upstairs that he forgot he was wearing his glasses. When Lori notices them, he quickly takes them off and says he doesn't wear glasses. He then asks Lori what they're doing, to which she replies, I do research. You sit there and don't bother me. Lori, I get it. You're upset. But in my sixth cousin twice removes defense, it was the other guy making fun of you in the hall. I mean, Jace merely laughed and didn't try to defend you at all. Okay, okay, now that I say it out loud, I can see why you'd be mad at him too. Chilly. Very chilly. Out of boredom, Jace starts playing with an electronic noisemaker, causing Lori to take it away. He gets mad and asks why she's treating him like a child, and she says it's because he's acting like one. Okay. <laughs> now, see, that's where you're wrong, Lori. If my boy Jace was acting like a child, he'd throw a tantrum right now and storm out, creating a big awkward scene. But he's not gonna. I'm out of here. Damn it, six cuz. This happens every time I try to stand up for you. You didn't do too hot in the teamwork department. Since Jace took the books, Lori runs after him. They decide that they can't work together, and Lori takes the books, saying that she'll write the report for both of them. The next day at school, Lori realizes that the notebook she gave Jace to find the books for the report is missing. She tracks him down to the football field to ask for it. He says that he must have left it in the basement at the library. Lori tells him that he has to get it since he's the one that left it there, to which he replies, That's because I'm not as smart as you are. I forget things. I act like a kid. I mean, you're acting like one right now. I can't even believe I pretended to be related to you. I mean, what? 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 <laughs> why, why would anyone do something like that? <laughs> Look, we're talking about Jace the face here, guys. He's like the coolest kid in school. I'm just trying to get you to lighten up. Lori says they can both go to the library together to get the notebook. Jace says that he has football practice, but Lori pleads with him to come by saying, Just do it! Jace says he can go after practice, but Lori says that she can't get there until 7 because... The plot requires them to be there after hours. So, Jay says he'll see her at 7 before telling her that she needs to lighten up. And she seemingly agrees, letting off some steam. <laughs> Later, at 7 p.m., the two arrive at the library to find it's closed. Lori starts to panic, saying that she's going to flunk and that she's never flunked a paper in her life. Jace offers to try to find a way in through one of the windows. Lori is hesitant, but he wins her over with that Jace the face charm. I don't want to be responsible for the one and only time you ever flung. All the windows are locked, and just when hope is lost, this happens. Once inside, the kids notice some things seem off about the library. The copy machine, computers, and anything else related to modern technology appear to be missing. They venture down to the basement, but Jay says that everything is different now, including the quiet reading room door, which is no longer hidden behind shelving. They also find a key hanging by a calendar from 1910. Okay, so they've traveled back in time? Question mark? Man, it's weird in here at night. Behind the door, they discover dusty books and bookshelves covered in cobwebs, and behind those, they discover... Wow, that is a lot of dead kids. Well played, Kiki. Well played. Lori and Jace leave the room trying to figure out what to do when this happens. It's Mrs. Hurley. Mrs. Hurley, it's me, Lori Napier. That's not Mrs. Hurley. Yeah, I know that bitch looks like she's holding a birthday cake from this distance, but I assure you, she means you both harm. Jace tells the woman to get back, resulting in... <laughs> Man! She stole his voice and didn't even have the decency to turn him into a human princess so he could court Prince Eric? What a sh** deal! The kids run from the evil librarian and her box that steals sound, but find themselves locked inside the library. 
The two get split up with the librarian following Lori upstairs. Jace uses a phonograph machine to lure her back downstairs, which works, but when Lori tries to help him in return, she gets her voice stolen as well. It seems like they're going to get stuck in the quiet reading room when Lori remembers Jace's electronic noisemaker. So the annoying child's toy overwhelmed the magic sound stealing box? Okay. Lori and Jace find themselves back in the modern library and are discovered by a security guard. They lead the guard to the quiet reading room where they find the first two victims of the episode still alive, but no sign of the much older and much deader kids whose spirits have been presumably set free. The police arrive at the library and give Lori back her notebook before sending the kids home. Lori and Jace agree that they're not such a bad team after all, and decide to write their paper together, although who knows how late at night it is now and the paper's supposed to be due the next day, but whatever. The tale ends on... Hey everyone, future me here and I have so many questions. This head librarian seemed to be obsessed with silence, so... Why were kids that were being quiet the ones getting kidnapped? Wouldn't it have made more sense to show some loud, talkative kids getting the silent treatment? I mean, when Jace is looking for the books for Lori, he's also being quiet when he gets assaulted by the ginger's ball. What was the point of this? Does the strict library ghost have a playful side? Was the ginger able to get that ball out as a message of sorts? Why does the library turn old-timey at night? Or is it time travel? And if it was time travel, why does the quiet reading room look old and decrepit in both timelines? Okay, and if it wasn't time travel, the first two victims were kidnapped in broad daylight during normal business hours. Why then was it necessary to imply that the library becomes devoid of technology in the evening when all that stuff would be switched off and not annoying the ghost anyway? And lastly, who is Mercy McGregor? How did she die? Did she die? Is she a ghost? How did she get her magic box of silence? And if she's not a ghost, was it time travel? And if it was time travel, did they not kill her in the past, which would have freed all the kids from back then and caused a ripple effect into the future that would have prevented the first two kids from being kidnapped? So why then would they have been found in the room? So if it wasn't time travel, then they killed her ghost in the present. And if that's the case, how is the library still open after all these years when who knows how many kids have gone missing there over the years? Kiki, are you even listening to me? The episode ends with Kiki asking if anyone wants to keep her company while she returns some library books to the night drop, and in typical fashion, all of these die-hard horror fans become big chickens. I mean, in fact, if these chickens were any bigger, they could be featured in a parade. Damn it, Kiki! <laughs> now for the review. The episode was pretty good for the most part, but gets hampered by the episode's short runtime. I think the concept is strong, the acting was solid, and the scares were okay, but there were a lot of inconsistencies with the villain, as well as a serious lack of backstory for her. I'm all for the monster of the week, but even a single line of dialogue about her from someone who works in the library would have gone a long way. Two out of three. The settings were fine. We had a school and a library, and honestly, the library set could easily just be at the school they film at. It wasn't terribly interesting to look at, nor did it get much better when the technology disappears at night. The quiet room looked great, and I wish the rest of the library could have looked like that when the kids get locked in there after hours. Like a tomb in here. The story is what gets done dirty by the short runtime. The foundation for a strong story is here, but we get nothing about Mercy McGregor in the episode. Why was she so obsessed with silence? Did any kids go missing when she was the head librarian, or only after she died? And that's assuming she's a ghost. I'm still unclear as to whether she was a ghost haunting in the present or if they time traveled back and defeated her back in her own time. But let's just assume that she was a ghost. Why does her ghost haunt the library? And how many victims have disappeared there over the years? All of this stuff could have been answered and while our heroes were in the library. Maybe during the chase, they get a moment of reprieve in the archives and find some old newspaper scans or clippings that mention her or the cases of missing kids over the years. I also think that having the kids pursued by her for a longer amount of time in the library would have helped bring more tension to the episode. Doesn't matter anyway. We're out of luck. The scares were here and they were okay, but I think they could have been improved. 
This episode did some really cool things with sound design during the chase, and while they were good, I feel like if they had gone the low-tech route and just removed all sound from the scenes where they're being chased, we could have had some scarier moments. They could have played around with shadows and other visuals since the kids wouldn't hear her coming. Younger me probably wouldn't have found this episode scary, but adult me still gets terrified over the prospect of partnered history reports. Bogus. The acting in this episode was good. There were a number of kids who only make a brief appearance, so I won't be covering them. Uh, in fact, as far as kids go, I'll only be talking about our two leads. First off, both of them were great at playing the characters that are labeled one way by others, but are actually very different than perceived. Jace was terrific as the childish jock who is actually kind of charming and a nice guy. Uh, Lori steals every scene with her high-strung overachiever who can't stand childish behavior. The two also had great on-screen chemistry. Come on, let's live dangerously. The adult acting in this episode was... missing? Question mark? I I'm not covering the teacher or the security guard as they're hardly there and... I mean, even our villain was barely in the episode, but I can't not talk about the villain. Um, I think she was menacing in her delivery, and while she wasn't given much to work with, her lines about silence were delivered with sinister gravitas. No talking in the library. Kiki, the next time you have a great idea like this, fake an illness halfway through your story so we can get another two-parter to really flesh out your characters. The tale of the quiet librarian meets the approval of the Midnight Society. The Midnight Society members poll on this one was another one-sided victory. At the time of recording this video, it was 93% in favor of, with only 7% against. So, way to silence your naysayers, Kiki. Exactly. I want to thank the following Midnight Society members for participating in this video's poll. It's a big list of names this week. In fact, if this list were any bigger, it could be featured in a parade. What did you all think of Kiki's story? Did you see it as a kid? Would you rather be trapped in a haunted library after hours or a haunted museum? Let me know in the comments below. Be sure to check out the next episode on the tale of the silent servant. Until then, are you afraid of the dark? Trust me, if his head got any bigger, they'd put him in a parade. <laughs> Thanks for watching, everyone. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like and a share. It really goes a long way to helping out the channel. Don't forget to subscribe and click that bell icon to be notified when more Midnight Society episodes go up. Thanks, everybody.